Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you today. We all uh, alive and kicking? Amen. All right. Now let me hear you breathe a little louder. Yeah, amen. All right. I have a message I've entitled, A Miracle in the Making. Of course, this video system is a miracle in the making. Just bear with me. But uh, as part of the miracle in the making uh, with this, the video system, is just a few more weeks away from having it all changed out anyway, so bear with us. So just, it won't be long. We'll have it all straightened out, and the new equipment will be in place, and stuff we've been working on for months to, to get it formulated. So it's, it's a little frustrating. Usually whenever there's a Microsoft Windows update, it just messes everything up. And uh, no matter if you turn them off or not, somebody hits yes anyway, so praise the Lord. But it is good to see you today. Uh, last couple of weeks I've been preaching about those lepers outside the city gates. You, you remember that, right? You all remember what we preached about the week before? Sometimes I do. But anyway, um, I talked about these, these lepers who were there. Remember their motto was kind of, are we just going to stay here till we die? Why sit here till we die? And they went to the camp of the Aramaeans. And you remember when they got to the camp of the Aramaeans that the Lord had caused that the, the, those people, those soldiers who were there in siege against Jerusalem, he caused those people to be confused and fearful, and they ran off into the dark thinking they were being attacked by the Hittites and the Egyptians. The lepers go into the camp and receive plenty of food and substance and clothing, and you know, you, you can almost see them going plundering each tent and being surprised and freaking out at all the stuff that was there and eating until they couldn't eat anymore. And, and then it said they went and started hiding stuff, and then they said, We're not doing we're not being we're not doing right. And they took on this whole new attitude of generosity and caring and talked about how in that message that that's a true sign of real character in our life when we learn how to be those kind of people. We learn how to be a generous uh, nation and a generous Christian people. But not only as a church, but as individuals that God's called us to live that kind of way. And one of the highest tr character traits, I believe, is just a, having a genuine attitude of, of benevolence towards, towards others and towards the work of God and towards the will of God. You know, and so I, I'm taking that and kind of segueing into two sermons today that will talk about the whole mindset and the context of how, how God works in a very miraculous way in our lives. That's why I've titled this message, A Miracle in the Making, how that the Lord uh, does things in our midst and with our lives and does some supernatural things. Now, I know that when we, as we talk about financial things this morning on, on this level, there's a, there's a lot of people that have a tendency to check out mentally or physically even. But I'm going to encourage you today to realize that there is a message here for you that if you get a little bit of this today and it really sinks in and you see the big picture, so many people think about this idea of stewardship and giving is kind of in the context of their little checkbook in their world, you know, in their wallet, but it's far bigger than all of that. And it involves the sovereignty of God. And those lepers, uh, last week's stories kind of began to discover a little bit of it, how they had this supernatural increase and this supernatural resources that poured out on their behalf but how it doesn't stop there and how they move forward to living that generous life. So I just think that if you catch some of this, you realize that this whole idea about God using us to do something re in regard to uh, being able to give and to help and to, to, to make a difference in the world, it really is supernatural. And it is bigger than, than what most people can really comprehend or understand. So I want to show you from this message today, and we're going to go back to the, to the children of Israel, uh, and they've left Egypt, and we're going to be talking about from Exodus 6, about, I mean, Exodus, uh, not, excuse me, not chapter 6, but uh, Exodus chapter 35 and, and how that God used these people. And we'll look at the passage in just a moment. But let me give a little bit more introduction because I think it's important you capture why I'm preaching this. And maybe I'll tell you why I'm not preaching to start with. Maybe that helps on some degree. Let me tell you why I, I am not preaching on it. I'm not preaching on it because we have money problems at the church. Somebody say Amen. <laughs> That's a good place to be, and most churches can't say that, by the way. Amen. It's not because we have money problems. That's not, we're not trying to, to, to get you to, to give to something and twist your arms. And listen, God's blessings are greater upon us than they've probably been in a long time. I mean, we're experiencing God's gracious, supernatural blessings on our church. And it's because of faithful people learning how these principles operate in their life. It doesn't occur by magic in the context that we just, you know, that we go and open boxes uh, on Sunday afternoon to collect the offerings and all of a sudden there's, God just made all this money up in the, in the middle of the day in the morning and created it and put it in the box. You know, it takes faithful people. So I'm not preaching on it because, and by the way, I'm not preaching on it because I'm trying to get a raise. All right? If you refer to the finance committee, how many times the last several years I've had declined raises, you know? So it's not because I need a raise. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a very content man. Amen. I'm a very blessed man. And so that's not the reason that, that I'm preaching to get, to get something 
more from the church. And certainly in this day and age that we live in, let me certainly dispel one more myth. I'm not preaching on this so we can get a $54 million jet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> then we need a Learjet so I can jump on my plane and get to my yacht faster, you know, or to my summer pl p vacation house in the Bahamas somewhere, all right? That's not the reason I'm preaching on this, all right? And it might help to add even this one. I'm not preaching on this because we want to build a Christian theme park. Amen. All right, we got too many Christians playing games as it is. We don't need another theme park, amen? amen? So with those misconceptions pretty much laid to the side and laid to rest, let me tell you three good reasons that uh, help you understand why I do preach on these things when I do preach on them, and you know, it's not often, it's a couple of times a year that I, that I mention this. And if I'd go back and show you how many times I've preached on giving in the last decade or so, it might even surprise you how few times in, in comparison to how many other things we've preached on that we've dealt with this issue. But first of all, I'm preaching on this because it's my job. My responsibility as your pastor to teach you the whole counsel of the Word of God. To teach the whole truth and nothing but the truth, all right? To, keep, to, to lay out before you just what does the Lord say in regard to us being faithful stewards. And as you know, the Bible has a great deal to say about stewardship and about accountability in regard to the things we say. But there's an action verse, verse 27. As Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders, he says this, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. So I want to be a faithful minister and a faithful pastor to teach you all of what the Bible says. Second, I regularly teach, as I stated, on this issue and on this topic, as I do other topics every year. I always make sure that I want to preach to you on soul winning. I always want to preach to you about being faithful in your disciplines like Bible study and prayer. I always want to be faithful to you to talk about those issues about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be faithful to cover all these doctrinal teachings so that we can grow in Christ Jesus. Because you know, as well as I do, if we don't, well, Peter put it this way, we need to stir up our minds by way of remembrance. And Paul, when he writes to them about doctrinal issues and theological issues and disciplines in their life, he says, I'm telling you what you already know, but I want you to remember how important these things are. So we cover these items again and again over the years. We keep bringing up these important doctrines of scriptures. But thirdly, I'm not trying to bless the church as much as to bless you. Because when these doctrines, and, we, and it is biblical teaching, when these doctrines are shared and we embrace truth on any level, no matter what the topic might be or the, the theology of Scripture might be in that regard, whenever I embrace it, I always grow and I always mature and I'm always blessed. Philippians puts it, Paul wrote to Philippians in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, I do not seek a gift from you, but I seek fruit that abounds to, on your behalf. In other words, I want to see you blessed. I want to see you grow in the Lord, and I want you to experience all that God has for you in your life. And that's mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or any other level in your life that you might experience the grace of God. I do believe that God wants to prosper us, not according to this prosperity doctrine of the new church today, but the doctrine of prosperity in Scripture is that God meets your needs with enough left over in your life to be able to reach out and be a blessing to the meeting of needs in other people's lives. That's real biblical prosperity. That not only have I received from the Lord, but I'm able to give from what I've received and bless you. Now, the setting of the passage out of Exodus chapter 35 has to do with God taking the people that he's brought out of Egypt. Remember, they've been in Egypt, 200 years of slavery. Now they've been liberated under the leadership of Moses, and they've come out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea, and they've entered into the wilderness. And God says, I want to do something uh, for you. And here's how I want to do it. And he starts dealing with what he calls the tabernacle. It's called the tent of fellowship or the tent of meeting. And listen, there's no other undertaking for building anything in the Bible as much as you see the description and the detail given to the tabernacle. For those of you who've been a member a long time of the church, you remember I preached about 20-something sermons out of those passages in Exodus on the tabernacle. Because when God gives that much insight and that much detail to something in Scripture, it's something you ought to tear you over and something you ought to pay attention to because God's trying to say something. The tabernacle gives us such a clear prophetic picture of Jesus Christ, of redemption, of our salvation, of worship. It's all very clearly seen as God details how the tabernacle is going to be built and every aspect of it is laid out. I mean, even the tent pegs and the ropes and the length and everything is so clearly defined, more so than the tabernacle or the ark or all these other building projects that God had his people undertake. 
but there's a great deal of detail there. And God tells them, I want to do something here, and, and, and I'm going to build this tent of meeting and this tent of fellowship, and there you're going to meet with me, and you're going to worship me, and we're going to experience, you know, true biblical intimacy the way I, I want you to experience as God's people. So let me read these passages, and we'll, and we'll discuss them a little bit further. In Exodus chapter 4, 35, excuse me, chap, verse 4, if you'd stand for the reading of the Word, verses 4 through 9, it say, states this, And Moses... He spoke to all the congregation of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze. And he goes on to say, not only to bring those items, but bring blue materials and purple and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, ram's skins, dyed red, porpoise skins, and acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod, and for the breastplate. God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Very detailed list of what the Lord says, I want the offering to be. This is what I want you to bring for the offering. Now, let me just back up even more. Let's say you're one of these people here, all right? Let's say you've been in Egypt You've been raised in Egypt. You've been taught that God would deliver you. You've been taught the basic things and truths of God's Word, but you haven't seen anything but bondage, all right, and suffering. Then Moses shows up on the scenes and reminds everybody that you're a chosen generation. You are a unique people for God's purpose. He reminds them of the promises of God that God made in Genesis to Abraham. That God's going to make a great nation out of you. And that from your nation... The whole world is going to be blessed. That out of this nation would come Messiah and the promises of God and the blessings of God. And all of a sudden, you're starting to get the picture. I mean, maybe you've doubted for so long because you've had such hardship and you've wondered where in the world is this promise of God. But now you're seeing it unfold. Now you're seeing God move supernaturally. You're seeing God send these plagues upon the Egyptians. And now you and your friends are starting to get a little more serious about this great nation of God thing, all right? Because you're seeing the blessings of God. You're seeing judgment fall. You see the ten plagues finally culminating with the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. You've seen how God supernaturally moved through the whole nation of Egypt and selectively with each house that had the blood sprinkled upon the doorpost, judgment doesn't fall there. Death doesn't visit there. You've been spared. You've seen the blessings of God. Now you've made your way out of Egypt, and as you've gone and your feet are hitting that sandy floor of the desert, you've made your way to the Red Sea. You've witnessed with your own eyes the supernatural deliverance of God as the Red Sea wide open splits before you, and you walk across on dry ground to the other side. You look over your shoulder. You see thousands of Egyptian soldiers that are pursuing you, and you watch the waters just roll over them and consume them all. You celebrated, you rejoiced. You've been through a few ups and downs by this point in the wilderness in chapter 35, but you're seeing, it's starting to make sense to you that we really are a people of God. Folks, let's, let's just bring this to the present day. You really are a people of God. You really are part of something bigger than yourself. You really are part of a greater kingdom. You really do have a greater king than the world has ever seen or known. You really are a holy nation, a holy people. You really are. And if you miss that in the context of your spiritual life, if your Christianity is, maybe I'm going to church today or maybe I'm not. You know, maybe I'll give something the offering or maybe, I'm, maybe I read my Bible, maybe I pray. You don't get it yet. You're not getting it yet. But when the eyes start getting opened and you see that you really are a holy nation, a people of God's own choosing, that are there for a reason to offer up spiritual sacrifice and to reach a lost world with the gospel and to be the difference maker in the culture. When that light comes on, your life changes. If that light hadn't switched yet, you're still going through these hard, rigorous routine of acting like a Christian. And there's nothing more miserable and there's nothing more boring than acting like a Christian. It's being a Christian that's dynamic. It's being a Christian that's life-changing. It's being a Christian that brings joy. It's being a Christian where you realize, I am on mission for God. 
Now, these people are starting to see this, and you see it represented by how they responded to what God was doing and how they responded so wholeheartedly. Man, getting church members to respond wholeheartedly is worse than pulling teeth. I'm speaking as an expert in the field. <laughs> All right, I know what I'm talking about. Getting people to move from their mundane, boring lives to the joy of really serving God, man, it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. It takes a great deal of prayer. I heard the story about a congressman who decided to visit one of the districts in, in the state that he represented. And while he was there, he, he gathered a bunch of pastors from the community together to have a, a visit with the pastors, and he spoke to them about what the government was doing for the churches and whatever, whatever. After the service, the, the, the gathering, he took one pastor aside of a small church, and he was asking him, you know, what can, the, what can the government do for you and for your congregation? Without blinking an eye, the pastor said, quit printing $1 bills. I'll let you think about that for a moment. Because that's all people want to do if they reach in their wallet. That's not the Christian life, amen? That's not what God, God's called us to. We're about something bigger. Believer's fellowship is about something bigger, all right? I mean, God's got something a lot larger in store. And if we just take a moment, we have a history. We, we, I mean, 30 years is, is some history. It's not a lot of history. It's not like the children of Israel's history. But we have a history. We've seen God do some incredible things with very, very little. I mean, it is mind-blowing, the, the, the outreach which God's let us have. I mean, we've started with nothing, and we continue to operate with, with very little. Y'all heard about the sideshow that was going on in, in the town with this little carnival going on? And they had the big guy, you know, muscle man there, and he's doing all these feats of strength. He has the crowd, and they're all going, ooh, and I. I mean, he's big, he's muscular, he's, you know, looked like he's been on steroids since he was four, you know, that kind of guy. <laughs> and he challenges anybody, he says, I'm going to pick up this lemon here, and I'm going to squeeze this lemon. And I'm going to squeeze every drop of juice out of this lemon. In fact, I'm going to give $100 to anybody in this audience that can pick this lemon up after I'm done with it and squeeze one more drop out of it. So he gets it up, you know, muscles are bulging, you know, every little blood vessel in his head's popping. He's sure up to the last drop lays it on the table and challenges. Several common, no, they can't get nothing, you know. Finally, one gentleman walks to the front. You know, he's not young, not real old, little peppery gray hair, though, but he's not a muscle man. He walks up and picks the lemon up without batting an eye. Boop! Drop comes right out. Everybody's freaking out. Muscle man's amazed. Sir, who are you, and how did you get the development to, to exercise that kind of skill set. He said very carefully, my name is Mike Miller, and I'm the finest chairman at Believer's Fellowship Baptist Church. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mike? <laughs> God has blessed us, and everything he's blessed us, we've used to the max. We've sought to get the best value, the best dollar. It's almost a competition around here who's going to save the most money, amen? The way we, we, we barter and deal and work on things and needing equipment or whatever it might be. But the thing is, God's blessed us to be able to even do those things and to be faithful stewards is a high calling in our lives. And it's a high calling in your life to be that faithful steward who will use it completely and fully what God's given you for the glory of God. We, we have experienced God, His blessing. And the beautiful thing about it is we are being used by God. We're in the life-changing business. Your life has changed. My life has changed. Others' lives have changed. And we're staying true to the gospel and true to the scriptures and true to the Bible. We're not trying to twist and sort and fix things so that people won't be offended or their feelings won't be hurt. We're just stating the, the plain truth. And I believe anybody that walks in this church building who truly loves Jesus and sees these ministries and the, the lives and the testimonies and the ministries of the church and the message of the church, they realize there's something truly of value that's taking place there. Amen. And we're doing it because we love Jesus, because we love God, and because we care about the things of God. Now, I want to take this back and say, how does all that relate to this offering that's being taken? Because it takes this same understanding about what really was taking place here 
and taking a real close look at it to see that's how God wants to use our lives and that's how God wants to work in our lives. Now understand, we're taking an offering. All right? So what is the offering? Now, he's already talking about their, their, their regular giving, all right? This is over and above their regular giving, all right? This is, not, this is not part of that mosaic law about tithing, proportionally giving something as they prosper. This goes beyond that. In fact, he's asking them for silver and gold and fine linen. Now, think about that for a moment. Now, why is he asking for it? Well, let's start with number one, because this is an important principle in your own life, understanding this first principle. The need they faced was literally caused by God, all right? The need they faced was to build this tabernacle where they would experience God in their lives. It was God's desire to be in the midst of his people. It was God's desire for them to have an intimate relationship of worship and fellowship with him of service and ministry for him and unto him, and for him to express his life and his light and his glory in their midst. God says, this is what we're going to do, and here's what it's going to take. Now understand, it's not much different than where we are today. When God tells us in the beginning, we want to start a church. This is how we're going to do it. Excuse me, Father, I was just fine before you told me we should build a church. I'm doing pretty good at what I'm doing. I'm enjoying my life. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> because that's what I want to do. But Lord, if we do that, you realize we're going to have to have a place to meet. And then if we have a place to meet, we're going to have to have a place to seat, to be seated. And then we're going to have to have a place. <laughs> those folks that are going to come, Father, they're going to, they've got kids. <laughs> and we need to minister to those kids. And then they're going to have needs. And we've got to minister to those needs. Lord, and all of a sudden, this call to start this church of Believer's Fellowship, there's a need involved. Well, God, why didn't you just create a building? Because then we wouldn't get to experience God. That, that would just miss the whole mark. This is not so much about God as it is about His people. And understand that. And even in your, this, this is a simple principle for your own life. God, God, you're facing some needs in your life that you wouldn't face if you weren't where God wanted you to be, right? God called me, you, you, you went off and you, you got married, all right? You said I do, she said I do, you both did. Now you've got some needs. And I'm not just talking about physical You need grace. <laughs> you need mercy. You need a spirit of forgiveness. You need a spirit of joy. You need a spirit of servanthood. I mean, all these things, they're needs that were created, all right, as a result of you doing what you do. Well, it was God's will. He told me to marry her. <laughs> Good. You still need God, all right? You're still going to trust God. As much as these people, you know, they, they've got to understand that God's requiring them an offering, but there wouldn't even be a need for an offering if God didn't start the whole thing off with a need to start with. But this is the way the supernatural acts of God are in your life and in your purposes if you'll just pay attention. We become, as the New Testament says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we are co-workers together in God's vineyard. God put a vineyard out here, and we're supposed to work it. In the beginning, God created a garden for Adam and put him in it, but it needed tending. And he puts Adam in there to serve the Lord in that garden and to honor God with that garden. Understand, even as a church, God brings us all the way to the place where he calls us to a new level of ministry, our new position, our new place. It always requires us to go back to God. But understand... We wouldn't have the need if it wasn't for God to start with. But having the need is a blessing. Getting to be a part of what God's doing is a blessing. Getting to be involved in the worship is a blessing. Getting to be involved in the ministry, it's a blessing. It's a higher calling. It goes much deeper and higher and further than anything that the world's going to do. So the need they faced was created by God. The second thing about this, the giving potential was arranged by God. You say, what do you, what do you mean here? If you look at these passages in Exodus 11, 2 and 3, remember we're in chapter 35. Now we're going to just kind of transport back in time, go back to, Acts, to Exodus chapter 11, and we're in Egypt. All right? The plagues have been coming. Things have been happening. And God speaks through Moses to the people, and he says this, Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor, and every man of his na her neighbor, the jewels of silver, of jewels of gold. And the Lord gave favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
So what's God saying? Now, the King James Version may say they borrowed it, but that's not the accurate word. It just says, go ask your neighbors for some gold. <laughs> it didn't say your Jewish neighbors. It said, go ask your Egyptian neighbors for some gold. I don't know how that goes. I go over to a lost man's house this day and say, can I have all your gold? It doesn't work real well. Unless you got a gun, it might work a little better. But <laughs> that's what they're told to do. It's absurd, is it not? It just seems absurd, doesn't make any sense. But often I find that when the Lord tells me to do some things, it doesn't always make a lot of sense. But God is always up to something. Did they have any idea at that time? I don't think so. I'm sure that most of them thought, oh man, God wants us to get all their gold and silver. That's pretty cool. I could use all the gold and silver and fine linen materials as possible. Bring, bring it on. I'll take it. Good for me. God bless me. God bless me. God bless me. You know, it's great to be a Christian who believes in the prosperity doctrine at this point. But the true prosperity doesn't stop there. It's not in the getting. It's always in the giving. It's not in the getting. It gets down to the giving. But understand this. God gave them what they would need so they could give. Do you understand that in your own life? That you have what you have because God gave it to you. When we talk about principles of stewardship and the principles of finance and the faith principles of the Word of God, it always gets back to that God is the source of all good things. That all, every good and perfect gift comes from God. You have a roof over your house. Why? Because of God. Now, you can go back and say, well, I saved and I earned and I worked and I did that, but you wouldn't have the ability to do that if it were not for God, right? I mean, it doesn't take a lot of arguing at this point. Most of us should understand that every good thing I have in my life, if I do believe the Bible, comes from God. You've been given what you've been given by the grace of God. You've been given what you've been given by the glory of God. And you should understand that it comes from God. And the in our hearts and out of our mouths, words of appreciation and words of gratitude. How could we be so blessed? How could God put us in a country where we have the potential to even be so blessed? You've been blessed. Now, you may have pillaged everything God's given you, and you may have been a terrible steward of what God's given you, and that may be why you're suffering today in some areas of need. But I believe God's still meeting your need even when you're backslidden. That's just the grace of God. The children of Israel, they got real backslidden for a period of time, and God still didn't let the shoes wear out. They still didn't have any needs. He still fed them with manna every day, right? And their clothes didn't wear out. He just took supernatural care of them. God takes care of you. And there should be a time in your life when you grow up enough to realize, I am so blessed. I'm telling you, the reason I'm so blessed is because God is so good. Uh, man, God, turn to the person and say, God is good. God is good. And some of you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go home tonight today to a nice place to live. You're going to go out and you're going to get in a car that it works and it's dry and even has air conditioning. I mean, God's been good to you. Hallelujah. You've been blessed, 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 blessed. It, 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 it's just amazing if we just honestly step back. Man, every good and perfect gift in my life really has come from the Lord, and I shouldn't take for granted what God's done. Now, the children of Israel, back to chapter 11, they're getting loaded down, right? The stuff's coming, the gold's coming, the jewelry's coming, the fine linen's coming, all these wonderful things. In fact, it says that it was just God gave the children of Israel favor. And what's that mean? They wanted to give them something. They didn't feel coerced. They wanted to bless the children of Israel. Well, they should. I mean, the lousy slugs have had them in slavery for 200 years. But nonetheless, <laughs> here you are. And, and chapter 12, it gives a report on it. In Exodus chapter 12, it gives this simple report. What happened? It says, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed, it says, this is King James, it says, and they asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. And the Lord gave people favor in the sons, so that they gave unto them such things as they required. And it says the children of Israel spoiled the Egyptians. So what's that mean? They just got everything they had that was of value. Amen. And when they left town, they had wagons filled with these valuables, dispersed among the children of Israel. Now catch what's happening. We have this God-arranged need, which was the tabernacle. And you're going to have some slaves build it, who for the last 200 years have only been paid enough to eat and drink, provide a roof over their head and food for the family. That's it. They don't have savings accounts. They don't have 501s. You know, they, don't, they don't have 401s or whatever it might be, 402s, 3s, Bs and Ks and Ls and all the other IRAs and dividends staffed off the bank and annuities. They don't get savings accounts. They got nothing. So when the Lord comes to them and says, I want you to bring gold and silver, 
If this hadn't happened in chapter 11 or 12, they'd just be going like this, pulling out their pockets, and they ain't got nothing. Gold, I ain't never seen gold. <laughs> it's up up at Pharaoh's place. I don't know, what do you mean gold and silver? I don't have any, what do you mean precious fine linens and, and, and ram skins and porpoise skins and all? We don't got that stuff. They couldn't say that, could they? Any more than we can say when the Lord requires of us an offering that we don't have it or we can't afford it. Because God's given it to you. Now, you may have spent it on yourself. Like I said, you may have pillaged the house of God for yourself and the blessings of God just for yourself. And understand, God gives you what he gives you for yourself, but for others as well and for ministry as well. He'll bless you so that you can be blessed, but you also become a blessing. So God does this supernatural thing. And this is why I don't want to get back to what I was talking about. It, this miracle in the making, this miracle that's taking place. God's providing, you know, in Providence, months, year ahead, what they're going to need for a tabernacle. He's already provided it back here while they were in Egypt. They leave the land with it. And now God says, I want you to gather these things and bring them to me. I think it's in, in, in Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He kind of gives them this, this principle. In, in chapter 9, verse 10, he says, now he, that's God, supplies seed to a sower and bread for food. That same God will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. What's he saying? God will give you what you need to give. You just need to give it. Amen. And all too often we get what we need to give, but we don't give it. We waste it. We spend it on ourselves. We misuse what, what God had for us because that's what we wanted or we wanted to take it for ourselves. And we just completely miss what was God going, what God had going. These are God arranged resources. Would you consider for a moment that maybe the resources that are in your life truly are God arranged? That the, in his sovereignty, he's let you have these resources and he wants you to have your needs met. But he also wants you to use you to meet the need, as he did these people, to meet this need that had come up by him. So we have this God-arranged potential. Now, the offering was according to God's will. This is something he's doing. This is not a man getting involved. This is not saying we need a Learjet or whatever it is. This is God with a God-arranged situation and a God-arranged need. And they, they begin to carry out the details of this particular offering need to the letter of what God said. In fact, there's four aspects that I found that were a part of this offering when you just kind of break it down in Scripture. And the four aspects go back like this. Number one, it was a willing offering. It says, and the people came in their giving, verse 5, as an offering unto the Lord. In verse 21, and they brought the Lord's offering. In verse 22, an offering of gold unto the Lord. In verse 35, I'm, excuse me, I'm, I'm different, 20, verse 29, the children of Israel brought a willing offering. Here are the people, they're just doing it. Nobody's whining and passing the plate four times and begging and telling sob stories. You know, we got to give to missions and showing sad pictures. There's just a willingness among the people to do something for the glory of God. They were just willing. The second thing about it, it was, it was an act of worship. And I think we miss this offering, this often about when it comes to our offerings, is that we don't realize enough that every time we give an offering, it is worship. It's an act of worship. Verse 5 of that chapter is an offering unto the Lord. Verse 21, they brought whose? The Lord's offering. 22, an offering of gold unto the Lord. Verse 29, an offering unto the Lord. I think it's that we should stay in that mindset that when we give our offerings, whether we're putting in envelopes or doing it by computer or having our bank send the check out or whatever it is, that we always make sure that we're, we're recognizing that what I'm doing in that moment, I'm doing it unto the Lord. I love God. I love God's will. I love God's work. I love God's, I love God's bless me. I want to be a blessing. And we're always making it, and I believe this is important. You say, why is it so important? Because it really makes it a declaration of faith. I'm doing this because I love God. I'm doing this because I believe God. I'm doing this because this is the will of God. This is offerings. This is worship. We th often think of worship as coming here and, and singing the songs or sitting in a Bible study or hearing the sermon. No, that's part of worship, but all worship really gets down to that point of, of us all laboring together, serving together, giving together. There's this genuine, authentic attitude, this willingness that I just want to be a blessing. This is for God. This is for God. I, I can't tell you how many times people over the years have come up to me and handed me a check at the end of the service. And they give it to me, 
And they say something like this, here's your money for the week. One, it didn't have my name on it, had the church's name on it. So if you're wanting it to go to me personally, J-O-E space A-R-M-S. All right, and I'll take care of that. But they, sometimes I think they want me to know they gave, perhaps, I don't know. Or they really think that it's going to me, maybe that's some ignorance there, they just don't know, they don't understand. But hey, the one you should be giving it to is the Lord. And it should be an act in your heart and mind that as you place your offerings, however you choose to do it, that when you push the enter button on your computer and do it that way, or you do it with your bank and you do it that way, or you put it in an envelope and you put it in that little box that's at the back door, that this is for God and for the kingdom. This is for the glory of God. And there's a willingness, but also a genuine attitude of worship that goes along with it that you're expressing. Now here's the part some people don't understand. It is what I would call a workable offering. You see, what do you mean? It's possible. You can do this. There's so many people who have the excuse, saying, well, you know, I really just can't do this. But these people, they understand the whole providence of God here and the sovereignty of God. God's given them what they need to give. Yeah. All right? So if, if God's given me what I need to give, so, when he, so that when he tells me to give, I can't say I can't give, can I? Now, I can say that, but I'm not speaking the truth. And it's like those lepers who said, I'm not being true, Right? I, I just can't give like that. I can't give proportionally. I can't, get, I, can't, I, I can't do that, and I can't do that every week. You see, I've got, I've got needs. Excuse me. I thought God said, I will meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. God truly is my source. If I'm going to say that, then I need to live that. If I truly really believe that every good gift comes from God, everything in my life has been a blessing from God, then I've got no problem with giving if I truly believe that. Yeah. Amen. Amen? And it doesn't, I don't have to be stuck on a 10% ratio either. I can, I can learn how to give abundantly. I can learn how to give joyfully. I can learn how to give, to give gladly. I can learn how to give freely when that's my heart as I realize it's worship. So here's this expectation that God puts upon His people to give for this need called the tabernacle. And then back here, God gives them what they need so they can fulfill the expectation here. In other words, God enables what He requires of them. God gives them what they need so that they can be the blessing and give what they're supposed to give. And lest you forget, there's one more point I think that's really important here. The, this offering is for everybody. It's for the whole group. It's not just for, you know, moms and dads. It says in Scripture that Moses spoke unto all the congregation, and they came, men and women. When God speaks to everybody, He speaks to everybody. How is it people can sit back and look at the Bible and select verses that, that they will choose to obey and believe, but I don't like these verses over here, so I'm not going to do that. I don't mind being faithful in the fellowship in my attendance because God wants me to do that according to Scripture, but I don't really don't want to give because, you know, I just don't have it to give or I don't think that means me. Or I, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not, that's not my gift. <laughs> I don't have the gift of giving. You got the gift of keeping. <laughs> the gift of wasting. This is for everybody. This is something we taught our children growing up. And whether they do it or not, that's between them and God. But it's my responsibility as a parent to teach them these things. Amen. And that they would learn these things that, hey, God's really the source of every good thing in your life. You can trust God and you can believe God. And God is going to meet your needs. But He's going to meet your needs, as Paul told the Corinthians, He's going to meet your needs with enough left over to be meeting the other's needs. Amen. And that God will supernaturally... It kind of goes back to this passage over here we talked about in chapter 11 where God met their needs by causing the Egyptians to give it to them. And they found favor. But in that... 638, give and it shall be given to you. The Bible said with the same measure you give it out, you receive it back, and it goes on to say, and God will cause men to give unto your bosom. It's the same thing. God will raise up someone to give me what I need as I'm giving to others what they need. That's your crazy cycle, isn't it? <laughs> but that's a, that's a true spiritual cycle that, we're, that we can literally become a, a source of distribution for the blessings of God in our life. But all too often, we just we wreck it and we stop it by, by, by not letting, giving God the place that He wants to work. I mean, this whole thing, if you look at it, there's such inspiration in it to me. It, it inspires me to know that hey, God's called us to, to build buildings and those kind of things like that. And it just requires a, a tremendous amount of commitment and, and service and, and trying to relate vision to people and inspire people and, and to be inspired so that you can inspire properly. 
But think about it. I mean, I told Kath when we first started this whole thing, listen, I don't mind this pastor thing God's calling us to. The last thing we're going to do is build buildings. And yeah, we're just about ready to complete another one, all right, in Magnolia. And so, by the way, the lesson is there, God's really not interested in my opinion. <laughs> just my obedience and my trust in Him. And it, you can put your opinion with mine, it probably goes in the same file cabinet, all right, in heaven. You know, non-essential stuff, all right? <laughs> but isn't, we can trust God. And as we do, listen, there, there was this act of inspiration. You can just see, you know, how, how inspired it was because it says, you know, it's reflected on They give it spontaneously. You see this willingness. There's an excitement. They gave it continuously. They just kept bringing it and kept bringing it. And they gave what was needed. It was sufficient. But isn't that the way God works when His people are right with God? In years of doing revivals and Bible conferences, one thing that we took very clear, careful notice of, and that when, we, when we go to a church or to a conference in churches, or just to revivals in churches, you could always tell by the end of the week if God had really, really moved. Because there was such a spirit of liberty, there was a spirit of worship. People weren't sitting around like some of y'all do with your hands in your pocket during praise time, kind of looking at the screen. Doesn't matter if it's on straight or not. You know, God... You know. Where's the joy? Where's the enthusiasm? It's, folks, we get tired. And so we have to literally mentally discipline ourselves to come to the place of worship at times. Amen? And you've got to wake yourself up when you come to church and come in and say, hey, this is God's house. I'm God's people. We're going to worship God together. Amen. You know, and I'm going to worship God if they do it together or not. I'm going to praise God. But that, that didn't have to be coerced. And usually when revival starts taking place, that's a norm. People just start getting, they want to they worship, worship Jesus. You know, they don't want to hang out in the lobby until the preaching starts. They want to get in here and get to worshiping. Amen. I thought you said it. A little, little struggle in there. Uh, amen. Get it out there. Uh, amen. They want to come in. They want to be a part of our God. They want to be in the atmosphere of people who are worshiping and blessing the name of the Lord. Because when God's people pray, the Bible says God dwells in the midst of that worship and praise. Amen. And there's just something about corporate worship. When we participate together, man, what a glorious blessing it becomes. So you just don't wait till everybody gets here to worship. You worship, all right? You know, some of those folks will be late for their own funeral. So that's probably the only thing they won't be late for, amen? <laughs> Unless the hearse has a problem getting them there. But here, look at this attitude of spontaneity. And it didn't stop with a one Sunday deal. They keep bringing it. In fact, they just kept bringing it, bringing it, bringing it until what had to happen. And ultimately, Moses, man, he had to issue a command. And the command was, hey, the needs met. It says, so Moses issued a command, and a proclamation was circulated at the whole camp, saying, let neither a man nor woman any longer perform the work for the contributions of the sanctuary. All right? Thus the people restrained from bringing any more. For the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. This need, remember I said this is over and above what they were normally given through the law and their tithes, but this was, this was an, a, a extra given. But God gave them what they needed so they could do the extra given. Some folks don't even participate in the regular given, much less the extra given. They were participating on such a level with such spontaneity, with such fervor, with such enthusiasm that Moses said, okay, that's enough. Would you like me to get up on Sunday and say that? Amen. Don't give anymore, we've got too much money. You know, I really believe that if, if churches would just learn to give the way God wants them to give, that would, there would not be a church that had a need. There would not be a mission that had a need. But most churches don't give that way. And because of all this, these results were God-glorifying. What do you mean? This tent of meeting happened. This place of fellowship. And can you imagine the enthusiasm when God visited that tabernacle for the first time and there was that cloud by, the, by day and that fire by night, that moment of just the glory of God. When they built the temple later on in the, New, in the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory, God just filled it. Just what enthusiasm, what excitement. And I believe anytime God's people serve, sacrifice, worship the way God's called them to, there's always that generated enthusiasm of the Spirit's presence. And just rejoice in the glory of God. God had this place to meet with them. Amen. God's people had hope. They, could, they, they recognized that they were the people of God. And that God did have a plan and purpose for their lives. And not only that, God's people, have, we have a history. In 1 Corinthians 10, it tells us this, you know, that all these things happened to them for an example, for us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Listen, we don't have to build a tabernacle. Do you know what we do have to do? We have to preach the gospel to the whole world. We have to preach, and that requires a lot. For us to do all the commandments 
that God has given to the church. All these words that God tells us, do this, go here, speak this, it all requires us to be faithful servants and stewards to the Lord. Even Paul was trying to tell the Roman church, hey, the Bible tells us that we, when we believe, we put our faith in God, it's the most important thing you do. He said, but hey, how can you believe if you haven't heard? Don't remember that passage? And how can they hear if we don't tell them, if we don't speak? And to do the whole world, he says, how can we speak if we don't send people? Not everybody can go. And so what is it? You've got to sin. So there's this, all these needs that are presented when we start obeying God. Needs for ministry. The building itself, it just becomes that place of the distribution warehouse for ministry, for meeting the needs. We meet, we gather, we worship, we celebrate, we fulfill ministries, we do ministry, and then we carry that task out to a lost world that surrounds us on every side. But bless God and the Lamb, He's put in your hands what you need, and it will keep coming to your hands as you give it. Hallelujah. And I said, we have a tremendous history at our church and our fellowship, but it's just been the grace of God that's caused all these things to happen and how we've seen God be glorified. I stood up in this pulpit back in 2007 as we were looking. In fact, in 2005, I sat down with my staff in a meeting. I said, I've had this burden on my heart for some weeks and months now that I really believe we need to consider being a multi-site church, at least one or two more locations. It's in my heart to do that. And I don't know where that's coming from, I just have been praying, and it's just, the Lord's leading me. And in, within, within a year of that time, sitting there and telling him that, there was a church that came unto us and said, we'd like you know, to help us, and then things didn't pan out at all, and we never even brought it to the church because it didn't go any further than that. And it wasn't too long after that, within a year after that, that another church. And it was at that same time that I stood in this pulpit in 2007, I said, folks, I believe God wants us to be a debt-free church. Now, we had probably about a half a million dollars, I think, in debt, a little over half a million. We were taking on a new location, which would cost us about twenty to 30000 just to do the legal work to transfer the ownership and the titles and all that work. Plus, that place also carried with it almost, a, I think, about $300,000 in debt. So here we were, at the same time, having about $800,000 in debt, saying, the Lord wants us to be debt-free. And you know, it was less than 10 years. We're debt free. Amen. Can somebody say amen a little louder? Amen. amen. Yeah, we can, let's, let's call up Mr. Watts's name. I'm debt free. We'll all say it together, all right? We'll all yell it into the phone. We're debt free. But our needs continue, by the way, so don't quit giving, all right? But we're debt free so that we can do more for the kingdom and do more for the glory of God. We can, we can serve more, be more, present ourselves in more locations and more places. There's more that we can do. We don't back up and say, all right, let's just rest on our laurels. Let's see how big the vision is and let's expand as God wants us to expand to meet that vision. Should he desire to create a greater need, he'll give us what we need to meet that need. How we do that? I'm going to tell you the same way we do that is what I told you back in 2007. Two words, trust, obey. Amen. Trust in the Lord and then obey whatever it is that God tells you to do. How do we get to where we are? I mean, debt-free, that's, that's phenomenal. But we're not just debt-free. Our asset load is pretty phenomenal as well. I would dare say that probably it's 8 to $10 million in that range today. All right? How'd that happen? We had nothing. We had a handful of people meeting at a hotel in a room. We could barely pay the 50 bucks to rent. And we started there. How we do it? We just started being generous. We just started being generous. Generous with what? With what God had given us. And the more generous we were, the more God gave us so that we could give more. And he has blessed us as a people. Folks, 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 you've got to see the glory of God. Now, I know that our attendance here in the last year, ever since Harvey especially, I don't know what happened. You know, we lost a lot more than just physical buildings and stuff in Harvey, and they carted off all that sheetrock and bad carpet. They took some of our members with it. I don't know where they went. <laughs> we went after them. We even put a search warrant out on most of them. All right? We're not stopping. We just regrow. Amen? The Bible says God trims you at times. You know, the Bible talks about how God will trim us back so we can bear more fruit. We just look at that as a challenge to bear more fruit. But don't sit on your laurels and don't sit on your hands and certainly don't sit on your purses. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. 
<laughs> Treasury Secretary gave us an amen. <laughs> we want to be challenged by the day that we're in. There's so many things that God would have us do, and we will do. Even when we were struggling and suffering, the way we got to where we got was by giving. We have always been a giving church. And I'm not talking about giving to ourselves. I'm talking about once it comes here, we give it out. Amen. We've been able to start churches. We've been able to help plant churches. We've been able to restore churches. We've been able to build up churches. We've done all types of mission works, multiple countries around the world, not just through what we do with our cooperative giving through the Baptist missions, which is a great deal, but even on our own just stepping out in supernatural places. I pray you'll be excited and you'll be thrilled about what God's done, but also remember that we need to be, continue to be excited Amen. about what God's going to do and what God's doing with our lives. Don't quit giving. Don't quit serving. Don't cut back. Well, I don't think the church needs it. That's not in your wheelhouse of, 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 of what the church needs. That's between God and His will for our lives. And if we'll just be obedient to what God, we know God wants us to do as individual believers, we'll see God do some more glorious things in our lives and in the time God gives us for the generation that we're serving, we want to serve it to the max and be all that God would have us to be. Now, I've been reading recent church statistics, and maybe you've seen some of those that talks about the average church member in America, you know, will probably spend more on dog food than they do the gospel or missions. Cat food in some cases. Yeah. Dog vaccinations more than the gospel. That ought to be a sounding alarm, should it not be? Yeah. The statistics are alarming. They say that there's so few people that give that a 10%, they say, in the average church, they, it's like from 3 or 4% of a congregation only will actually give a 10% contribution. Now, I, I would think that maybe at Believer's Fellowship, it's at least 15 to 20% of you probably give an actual tithe. I don't know what you make, so I don't know what your tithe is. It's a matter of faith, you know. We do let people know in leadership, if you're going to be an elder, you know, if you're going to be a deacon, you need to be tithing. They know that from the beginning. Do they tithe or not? Well, it just shows where their character is. I don't know. They tell us they do. Or they wouldn't say, yeah, I'd like to be the deacon. All right? You still with me? But let me tell you one statistic I saw that flat blew me away. And I thought, therein lies the evidence for those who do. Do you realize in this national poll of thousands upon thousands of Christians that they interviewed about this issue, they said that of all those people who are 10 percenters at least and more, they said, it's going to blow your mind. I think I'll wait you wait for a second and get a drink of water. <laughs> like announcing the finalist on TV, isn't it? <laughs> of the people who do give 10 percent, eight out of 10 people on that list are all credit card debt free. I mean, catch that. Here's this great group of tithers, 80 plus percent of them are credit card debt free. Amen. Because I think once you get to that place in your life that you're that, and you make that kind of commitment, you begin to understand that God's going to meet your needs. You're going to put stuff on credit cards. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's, a, that's a step of maturity that will change your life Amen. if you take that step. That those who do give are the most debt free people in the country. That's phenomenal. But that's evidence. But who needs evidence? We live by faith. Amen. Amen. We trust God. God said it. That's just said it. I don't need to take a poll. Amen. Only poll you ought to be grabbing is a fishing pole. All right. Just go catch some more fish for Jesus. Amen. Today's message, by the way, you know, is to encourage you. In fact, I have discovered the only people who get upset with me talking about sermons like this are the people who don't give anyway. <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that the way that works? They're the only people who get upset about it. Those who are faithful and those who are responding can step back and say, amen, amen, amen. I've seen God. I know what God's doing. I've watched God. I've seen God. I can bear testimony to that, to what the Lord has done. I want this message to be an encouragement to you today. And I want you to leave here just being, if you haven't been that kind of giver, start being that kind of giver. It'll take a step of faith. It may hurt a little bit to start with, but you develop a lifestyle, God will change your lifestyle. He has a way of doing that. He'll meet your need. It's not about getting more, though. Understand, it's never about getting more. It's about being a servant and loving Jesus and worshiping Him. Those people gave spontaneously. The Bible talks about being a cheerful giver. Amen? Being cheerful. 
And I pray that when you place your offerings, if they're God-honoring offerings and God-obedient offerings, you ought to walk out of here as a happy camper because you have obeyed the Lord. And God's grace and blessing and mercy is upon your life for your obedience because that's what the Bible teaches. If you're not there, get there. Step of faith. Do the hard thing. Do something you hadn't been doing before. The Bible says, test me, try me in this, says the Lord. See if I will not do what I promised to do. That's God's challenge to you. God said, try, try, try me in this. You don't test me in it? It's about the only place you get to test God, by the way. God said, run a test on it. Start giving, see what happens in your life. And you'll see the God's grace and blessing on it. And I see some of you just nodding your head because you know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you're not there, get to that place in your life, see what God does in your life. If you are there, keep rejoicing and keep teaching that lesson because that's one of the greatest lessons you'll learn. It'll affect your life on so many levels, from your job to your family to your kids. It just pours into every area of your life when you get free in Christ. So when God does put a need on your life, you don't freak out saying, I don't think I can, it won't work, I can't work. You just give it because God's given it to you. A place of great freedom to be in your life. Amen? Amen. We're not going to give an invitation, formal invitation this morning, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We don't need the band or anything this morning. I just want this, the quietness of the Holy Spirit moving across this room this morning. And I want you to examine your own heart in regard to this message today. I believe that whenever the Word is preached, it should always challenge us. It should challenge me. It should challenge you. But what the Lord has spoken to you, young or old, male or female, let God speak to your heart this morning. If you haven't had this discipline in your life, commit to the Lord today to take this discipline up. If you haven't been faithful in this discipline, get back to where you know God wants you to be. Get back to trust in the Lord again. It is a life of faith. See what God will do. If it's never a place that you've ventured before, maybe it's just new to you, get into the Word of God and see what God has to say. It'll blow your mind to see that God is up to something, that there is a miracle in your life in the making. And it's already started with God providing what you need before you ever need it. My God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. He's already got the supply before you ever have the need. You don't have to beg Him. He's waiting to meet it. But the way you unplug the line, so to say, is you start out in faith by giving and honoring the Lord. With your head bowed, you just, would you take a moment with the Lord? Whatever the Lord said to you, would you respond to Him today? It'd be more than an act of coming forward. Maybe the act of going to that offering box today and placing in what the Lord's told you.